Good evening, folks. Uh, and Lawrence, whose guitar this is. Blimey, just moving a few things out of the way. So just what I what just what I what I just want to show you is um, tonight's the night. I've done the well. I've done the refret and I've done most of the fret rounding. Well, I've got a bit more to do, um, but it's all sort of getting there, and we're getting ready to. Um, we will be ready to respray the whole body with satin nitro when the weather allows. But <coughs> between you and me, it isn't going to be yet because it's pretty ghastly out there. So, um, what it's important thing to do today, and I've just done it off camera, so I apologies. I was I was charging up my batteries and stuff. But um, what I wanted to do, plan to do today, was to place on the new bridge and to check exactly where the string action fell um, to see whether I needed one, none, or a recess, a shims, anything like that. So what I did was I set the new bridge, I'll come on to the d new bridge in detail, but I set the new bridge um, with some strings up to the headpiece which I put on and I'll come back to that um, in a little while. Uh, and also I want to go through this bridge with you in sort of detail, but I put on my red shoes and dance the blues. I put on uh, this bridge, two strings, and I lined it up, and I held it down, and I also then checked the last fret action here. And what I did is I set the action of this, um, the up and down action of this thing to eh, halfway-ish. So there's upwards room, and at halfway, it was dead on the action I wanted. So first thing is, hey, no cavities needed so it's just a positioning issue now so no cavities um, and I will have a tiny bit of downward room if I need it to go down which I doubt I will because it's 1.2 ish on the there and a tiny bit of uh, upward room so that's fantastic I also marked on my 648 line and just for complete sanity check it's always a good thing to do to go back and double check that we're dealing with 648 so let me just place that there for a second because if you get this wrong and you're m working to the wrong scale the bridge will be in the wrong place so i'm just going to stick that there on the zero fret go up to here and we have 324 all right so it's 648 so it's a strat scale type of neck um so that's good so we have a position there i've got two of the holes there so um what i'm think I'll do now is let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of this Chinese bridge I'll show you something that'll maybe make you change your mind so I think I prefer I would like hmm I would like something a bit maybe a little bit lighter to put it I don't know why but just somehow purple black on purple don't seem to do it for me so let's have a bit of a, a bit of that as a backdrop. Hmm. There it is. Um, okay, and actually while I'm at it, why don't we get out, just pull out the bag, this thingy, just so we can kind of make a, a comparison and leave all the bits in there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> get them on. Uh, I'll do some close-ups in a minute. So I think I'll just turn off the heatery thing because I'm fairly comfortable now heaven knows I'm comfortable now so we've got on this guitar we this is the first time I suppose um, in this video you've seen this bridge that this was that we've been working towards and it has some of the saddles already taken off um, and I'll put them back on again in a minute so the first thing to say is why this bridge and I probably talked about it several times but this bit can be a segment on its own in its own right. So why this bridge? Um, well, the first reason is that Lawrence was fed up with this bridge. Big, chunky, effective, whether it, you know whether you like it or not, it's effective. Truth is, this spacing here is just enough to turn the things if you want to. The, the machining on here, the milling or the etching or whatever it is that makes these little novels, that's good. You can turn it by hand and there's enough space between them. Um, but there's also some up and down movement which affects the tuning, which um, I don't know if you'll be able to see here, but there's a bit of forward and backwards moving in this position. 
Um, and also, because of the way they ended up in the guitar, um, Lawrence's p personal dislike was this kind of bridge has to hang off the back end of the thing like so, naturally to get your things in there, because they're horizontal. Right? Um, any bridge with this kind of horizontal sticky out tuners tends to demand this rebate shape, which you'll see whether it's a curve or whether it's this sort of more squarey looking thing. But it's very common, but it's the only way you can really get access to those tuners. So first of all, Lawrence doesn't use the tremolo. So this whole tremolo thing with the additional parts in it aren't really necessary. So that whole kind of arrangement isn't what he wants, but he loves the guitar and how it plays. So, um, so this is kind of a lot of overkill for something he doesn't use. Plus it's got this up and down. Plus in the position it's in, he finds that he's constantly, um, when he plays it sitting down, it, he's constantly hit his leg and he's constantly hitting the tuning and, and making it go out. So he was very clear that he wanted this off because it was just annoying him. Um, so we, there, I know there are, there are other options, but to be fair, they all end up being a version of this, or at best individual ones of this, but with still all with horizontal tuning buttons, which means if you want to get access to it, you have to hang it off the back of a shape. Um, now, I also know that out there in the world is this strange little device from China, from AliExpress, and it's actually it's a slightly newer version, but it's still the same thing. And I'll try and show it to you. It is the way they describe it is hilarious. They call it a worm-involved gear uh, bridge um, headless device. Um, and they do actually, funny enough, on AliExpress, they do a variety of these things that kind of do the same, um, just different looks. And some of them are quite cool looking, you know, some chromey, silvery looking things. But in a sense, they're, they're, it's quite a commonly duplicated design in the plethora, plethora of AliExpress type headless bridges. But one reason, I've used this about eight years ago, and I've used it on several guitars, and one of the reasons why I immediately saw a light, I took a liking to this bridge is the fact that, look, these are canted up at, actually, these got a bit more straight up, but they're about 80 degrees, 75 degrees to the straight up. They're nearly vertical, not quite, but they're, they're sticking straight up. Now, if this was my guitar, suddenly, if I'm designing a guitar, or I've, say I've got a strap that I want to just turn into a headless, instead of having to carve something out of the back there, this can suddenly go where the old bridge used to be. Obviously not, maybe somewhere like that, whatever. It can go exactly where the old bridge used to be, providing you've got a solid foundation for it. Um, and because of that, you've got, it can do it because you've got these things facing upwards, which give you access to them. Now, that was a great thing. The other thing that makes this good is on certain guitars, particularly this one, like the Hona, this headpiece, and there's problems with this, so I'm going to come to in a minute, this headpiece on this guitar um, demands a ball end to work. And the original bridge also demands a ball end to work, because even though it's got this fabulously cute little tray that I'm winding out now, if you can see, and it holds the ball end in there, or something like that. Oh, no, it's... Is it? Come on. Oh yeah, it slips in there. I, I'm thinking it slips on its side in there. Anyway, so that, that's how it does it, and it pulls the ball. But this plus on that guitar requires you to have double ball end strings, which are expensive and for which there is clearly a limited range of options. You can't choose your brand or favorite thing. So the beauty of this funny little Chinese thing is, first of all, the, the tuners sit upwards, which allow me to, uh, let's give you an example. Let's say I want to chop the head off uh, my A strap. This is very dusty, um, but let's imagine, we've been through this, but let's imagine that's my strap, and I can chop off the headstock, fill a block in there if I like, and I can stick that on there, and lo and behold, I've got myself a thing that, to all intents and purposes in the body, looks like a strap, but has got this bridge on there, and the headstock can just chop, have the headpiece cut off. So that is a major freedom for regular folks who have got spare bodies that they need to use or want to use up and so on and so forth but whoops, but they can't do it with a, a more expensive type that has to um, have the rebate cut away because you, you then just disfigure your strat and of course and not only that you have to then 
cut away into the finish and you have to refinish it and that's just a major hassle. So suddenly this thing is quite attractive as a thing to let you get creative. So the simple thing is, uh, the reason it works frees you up, or the reason it, it's good and doesn't require you to use double end ball strings is, for example, if, for a, if we have a standard headpiece that uses the ball here, I mean you can get them without that, but we'll come to that in a minute. But let's say we have the standard headpiece, or the this is the Hona headpiece here, which takes the ball end string in there. There is a problem with this, and I'll show you in close up why. Um, then really, unless you're buying the ball end strings, if you've got a regular string, you're then going to have a cut end down that end. And if the cut end now comes down to here, the, the beauty of this little device here is the cut end goes onto one of these drums through a little hole in the middle of the drum and these keys here, these knobs here, wind in onto a drum. So this vintage ancient style of thing just with a drum, a little brass drum with a, some gears and a, a thingy up the top there is absolutely brilliant because you're suddenly freed up to use um, ball end strings where they should be. The ball taking the weight at the headstock and the cut end on here. Um, once this is on, there is a relatively small amount of up and down movement and likewise a relatively small amount of individual backwards and forwards movement for each saddle, which of course is why it's critical to get this placement exactly right. And for me, the start point of this one, I mean this is, uh, I'm just going to do a tiny tweak here, but I've made a mark and I've started, as you tend to do, by moving this out. You, now you can go clearly, you can extend out over, so we can put this here or we can bring it in flush and bring that back which takes it to about here or we can bring it further in. Really if you're kind of playing the game I would start dead on the line knowing you've got a bit the other way and then I would go sort of vertical down. Now this is actually slightly different from where I had it placed before but we're working that off the 648 line um, which you can probably see better there and we're going to line it up and then we'll mark out our holes to, to drill. Um, so, but you can see there's a bit of movement backwards and forwards and um, it actually can go quite a bit over the, the edge there, but if I start there, I mean in a sense it'd probably be even better to start slightly over the edge because you tend to want to use all of the backward movement. So I think I, knowing the game, having played this game before, I think what I will do is probably start as far out because it's never less than 648 and so that's that overhang will look just a little bit like that. Can you see it just just over the line? Okay, but we'll come to that in a minute when we set it up or fix it for the first time. So the, the, so the great thing this bridge is, it allows you to use any shaped guitar without cutting the stupid rebate shape in the back. Um, it has the tuners pointing upwards so that you can access them and not have to cut out shapes out of whichever guitar you use it on. So you freeze you up for design possibilities. Um, on the plus side, this uh, drum business doesn't take much wire. I usually cut about so much, about an inch and a quarter past the tuner, and that's more than in, uh, past the um, knob thing, and that's more than enough to wind on. And that small amount of wound, wind, wind on makes an incredibly secure tuning. Um, this bridge for 30 quid now, you can get it delivered from AliExpress. This bridge delivers incredible tuning stability. Um, this I'm getting feeling already that this version is slightly better in terms of the feel of the gears and everything than the previous one, so that's good. Um, so what they do is they have in the side here, they give you a little magnetic crank. <coughs> if you pull it out, it's got a little knurled handle. Oh, look. And the idea is you place it in the little thing there. I'll silhouette that against the white so you can see it a bit better. That fits in there, and basically and when you either come to load up a string or tune it, you would do that to load the string or that to tune it a tiny bit. So that's very handy and it fits into this uh, hollowed magnetic recess. I'll drop it. Yeah, that's the problem. You drop it, it's gone. But what I tend to do is I keep that one in there as a permanent safeguard. And what I have done and do on my guitars is I make a magnetic tuning knob which is this device made from a, a knob. And the idea is this will later on 
fit into this hole and dock inside there with a clang. Right? And that will just sit neatly, mostly neatly out the way, just a little bit sticking out, just enough to grab it. And when you pull that out, halfway in your set, um, and that goes and clicks on there, and then you do a little tune with the knob. Go to the next one, tune, go to the next one, tune. That's got a 5 mil hex key in there. And when you're done, you go clang. And the reason it fits back in is that there will be this magnet. There's a magnet in the bottom of here. There's a piece of cut uh, hex key, which is a 5 mils. There's some JB weld there to keep it in place. And then you've got a magnet that's going to be in the bottom of the dock, welded or JB welded in place. And then that you'll put that there and it'll stay there. So that's really good. And if you were to lose this and you're playing somewhere, then you always have that to go back to. But I tend not to use that at all. So you might say, well, that's a fiddly way. Yes, it is. It's one of the slight downs on this. But my experience is the tuning stability you get from these, once you've stretched your strings pro properly and your nut's good, uh, you so rarely have to tune it. It really isn't a problem. So I got used to just pulling that little knob out, <laughs> tuning up, checking out on my tuner, which is always on in line with my amp and then clanging it back in its place and ready to go. And I've had it literally stay in tune for a 45 minute set, not had to adjust it once. Gonna keep an eye on the tuning and it's always spot on. So that's the positives of it. Um, also, it's clearly a massive po 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 positive that it's cheap. It's 35 quid delivered, about 32 quid delivered if you're lucky. Um, you can see there's some grease or oil on there. Now, that, so that's, that, that's the main positives about it. The negatives are one that it doesn't, it just isn't the same machining as the Steinberger system, okay? It's a different metal. People snottily call it pot metal and they're right. Compared to this sort of hardened steely stuff that you got here, this is much, much cheaper metal. However, it's only a problem really, and I found this through experience, the only time this is a problem is during the initial setup phase. And during the initial setup phase, um, and I'm just going to show you, let's see if we can zoom in. It's not the easiest of camera. Oh, sorry, I like whacking things. Right, let's go to here. So just for instance, um, let's imagine uh, this is the little screw. You can see the little machine screw there. It's very small. I'm going to uh, take it off, but I always go with a brand new hex key, the sharpest possible hex key in the world, because first of all, being pot metal, the head of that little machine bolt can strip. Also, what's susceptible to stripping, if you're not careful, are the threads on this thing. If the threads on these little screws go, then it's ruined. Okay, so the first thing I do is I gently slack them off. That's not a very convenient hex key to use. Then I get my, hmm, that thing, driver type shaped one, and I use that as easy as spin, and I gently use that to turn in a nice straight line, putting, sorry, putting no obvious, um, no more obvious pressure. So I, I really can't make you see this very well. Now you can see why, because I'm, so I've undone that, and up comes my little pony, my little machine screw. Come on, focus in, please. That really isn't good. Come on. Yes. Right, so just a little Chinese machine screw with a very, very fine thread, and it's looking quite good at the moment. And that has freed up this little unit to come out. So there we have our basic saddle. It's, a, it's like a, a drum with a cam on it. Um, that cam is your saddle, that little brass cam, little roller there is your saddle. The cam is very simple, right, look at this is the side, the other side, and it it moves round, so, sorry, if you, it's very difficult to hold this still, so it moves round, you may be able to see, oh, there we go, you see how this first grub screw is stopping it, or let's say we push it and it moves the cam round, you see that? So that's effectively adjusting the height. Of course, if we take it out, nothing happens unless we've got strings on it, in which case the strings pull it down like so. Okay, and that 
that happens to be set at its lowest so that's the, the bottom part that's the action at its lowest okay and as I say if we want to adjust it we have a string obviously on there and you notice this is a little a trick so when you first set it up notice there's a potential for error here you see how the the pusher screw right is pushing now against what could be is it going to work yes it is sometimes if you're not careful if you go too far and pull this out too far you guess what's going to happen this can come around to there now what happens if i oh, let's do something where you can actually see now what happens if i screw that in there now not knowing as far as i'm concerned that's right down that's the lowest action i can get well actually sorry bloody hell i'm saying look there's the lowest action i could possibly get or use truth is that's below a usable level and the reason it is is that we turn it around you can very easily see that any attempt to raise that up is going to crash into it's going to lock and it already is locking this screw is going to crash into the side of there and it will just knack of the threads up so you have to be certain that when you start and they will from the factory but I always make sure myself you have to go first of all in with the thing like that and that has to touch it and that's your lowest possible start point and I always make sure but I'll do it a bit more carefully in a minute with each one of these but you can see that there's a potential for you to get it wrong there so the operation is quite simple your string is on the cam uh, on the roller you dial it in until you get the action you want when you've got the action you want the great thing is is you switch to this little one which had to be out I should have said and then you dial it in to lock the cam in place okay and that is now that is typically how it would end up looking right that at its height setting in or out can come quite a bit out and that go, always goes in to lock um, truth is you don't have to lock it but I you know it's worthwhile doing so I'm going to grease both of these little screws up a bit more than they already are so that they have the best possible travel and I'm also going to um, I'm also I can't see where anything has gone now I'm also going to grease up these screws all of them so I'm putting this back in the place you can't quite see at the minute over there where all of them are in a line and I'm going to do the same again Let's see if I can now not look from above because otherwise you won't be able to see what I'm doing I'm now going to um, gently undo the one holding the low E down and with this is quite stiff and firm so that's actually not too bad it's not I wouldn't call it call it loose as far as pulling uh, getting it undone is concerned but I've switched to my vertical driver and up it comes still in still in or in the little frame the screw sticking through you see that and that's my high E and I'm going to put it there for a minute so then we have the, the naked plate which I'm going to use in a minute to draw the position that I want this to sit at um, and what I'll do is I'll use the high E to move things around plonk it down and then mark my places so you what you can also see in here are a couple of things there are a series of hex screws down there which actually um, takes uh, allows you to take all of these off and there's also a set of screws machine screws sitting on there truth is you don't really need to take any of those off uh, unless you want to take them apart and, and grease the drums I f found the drums I've never really had to do that. I don't tend to take that apart. Interestingly, these these uh, tuning head knobs things are much tighter or stiffer than I've had before. Um, and in the past, if you've had them possibly even this stiff, they have run a risk of crunching the gears. But I'm going to see, I'll have to feel my way. Now, if you don't think, if, they, if you feel they're too tight, you can just gently hold them and slack them off a bit and the important thing I would suggest is that these are better being just slightly looser than tight seems a weird thing because we're very often used to doing things up mega tight but a, a little bit of looseness is better on these um, that one's probably a bit looser than all of them but yeah but a little bit of looseness one thing I forgot to mention that they've done on this version um, which they haven't done on any others is they've instead of just having a straightforward round barrel with a, a hex socket in the end they've made a hex socket but they put a cross uh, they've crossed the can you see they've um they've made a cross 
at the top of each one. And actually, that means uh, if you're playing, you potentially could make your adjustment with a plectrum. If you've got nothing else, uh, a plectrum or a coin would allow you to tune. So that's a pretty neat little additional idea. Good for them. So to coming backwards then, this stuff can stay where it is when you first get it. The bit to be really careful about is the each individual tuner and all its rotating parts. And what I tend to have is a little bit of a uh, grease pot and a bit of get me a bit of tissue paper and I just go through if I can find the uh, cocktail sticks I tend to go through and just put a little dab of grease on each one it they may already have come pretty well oiled well oiled but I don't think there's any harm putting an extra bit of sort of grease or motorcycle grease type stuff on there so if I start with them one by one let's let's bring the low E so get me a grease pot there and what I'm going to need is my thingy <laughs> that one because these are quite loose so and I'm going to take them out in the order that they in and put them down so there is the tuner and here is the lock so very gently and this is a part where you really have to be gentle so the lock has a little point on it the tuner is more of a blunt end um, but you've got to be gentle and then when we've done that you'll see that the, the cam device is really simple and it just falls out and then sits back in there okay so that's our low E because we can tell it's on this side the this bit will be covered by the next one lining up so what I then do is I will get each one in turn and I'll just dip it a tiny bit in the grease and then I'm going to very gently now this bit again is quite tricky you've got to look at the angle you you could easily strip it right now in returning it to place because it's this is right this second it's a steeper angle there you go be very very mm, what's the word be very gentle if it feels like it's not going in something's not quite right and then we sort of hold it there and we want it to begin with we want to come down and just touch with a newly freshly greased thing and we want it to touch remember onto the cam so it turns it and doesn't lock it so that's a good place for that one ready to go second one we do is the locking thing with a sharpened bit on it again we get a little tiny bit of grease this grease and now it gets stuck in there and you have to fish it out this grease actually came from my I had it from my motorbike days this was the, in a grease gun that I used for my Z, uh, ZZR, believe it or not. Not that you ever need to use a grease gun on a ZZR. Okay, so that's just partially in. Both of them are partially in. The next thing you want to do is get the little machine bolt. Now this one, again, in, in, in the spirit of the way we took it off, this one I'm going to put a little bit of grease on and then I'm going to... This is really difficult. It's a little bit looser because this is a bit less um, less machine the end of that thing. The thing I'm thinking about is the end of that hex key. Right, so this one's going to go on there in the low E position and then I'm going to need to now lower this down into that hole there. See it? And so held on by a bit of grease. <laughs> That's stupid. That's gone. A sliding. So put that back on and then I'm going to put it down into there as neatly as I can and again start off with a very gentle turn make sure it finds its way in smoothly and I can go down until in fact I don't want to tighten it up but I'll know that I will switch to this one fresh key it's, it's not run it, it's nice and sharp here it's not going to run any chance of stripping out that head of that um, little machine screw so that's the routine and you only have to really do this once um, or I only do this once so we just get a chance to undo everything grease everything and so you just have the satisfaction of knowing that you've got this part of things 
um, as greased up as it can be and that things should operate nice and smoothly. Uh, this is not, this really isn't the best way to get grease. Grease, put some on there and see if I can just spread it out a bit. Like that. So, and, and like I say, that the place, the point at which you'll do any damage is when you're reinserting things for the first time. So you've got to feel the angle. There's a little bulge in the metal here that sort of tells me what the angle should be. So just pay attention to that and then run it, run it through. It lands against the cam. That's that one done. And you'll see a bit of uh, excess grease come out. Just leave it. You don't need to clean it up. It's better that it's there and it will it'll sort of work its way in over time. And then this tuning, uh, locking one, sorry, has to be um, some of the way in. So those are the two there. We put it down next to its neighbor. And then we get the machine screw and so on and so on. So it's obvious this is just going to go on. But this is the routine I like to go through to make sure these stand the best chance of all of a long and happy working life. Now, of course, I'm getting a little bit of um, stuff here and there. And if it gets on these saddles, then there's no harm in just wiping that off there. You don't want those to be sticky. But um, and I'm just doing these off pair by or set unit by unit. OK. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all of these greased up. So I'm confident I've prepped this. Um, and once I've done that, I'm going to drill the or mark up finally, uh -huh. the scary final markup. It's a final markup. I'm going to mark up the bridge actual position, which is pretty good. And then I will drill the anchor uh, fitting screws. Now they come with the obviously Chinese screws and I've never had a problem with them. No, of course they're not the world's greatest material in the world, but think about what they're doing. They're going into a countersunk uh, hole and they're going into wood. Your worst chance, the worst thing that might happen to them is it, there's a small possibility that they might uh, shear if you tighten them up or if you, actually if you put them into wood that's too dense. And I've done that because I used to do make guitars out of ecchi, which is the, it was like steel. Um, and so that was quite common to break off a, a bridge mounting screw. Um, and uh, I have more than a few guitars where the broken off screw is sort of lost in the system somewhere. <laughs> Just ignore it and build around it, cover it over, build around it. It's not a problem. So some people might say, oh, God, I don't want to be doing this fiddly stuff when I get a new bridge. I expect it to do everything I want without any problem. And I, I just think, you know, you can do this. And I have to say, I've even converted this little bridge here, not this very one, but I've converted these bridges to left-handed. Because amazingly, they do not come. They do not make a left-handed version. So to make a left-handed version, I have placed all my saddles in a left-hand configuration. Um, obviously, the, the saddle part's on the other side, but it's fine. You just position the bridge slightly differently, but you still can use it. Um, and then what I've done is I've drilled through and tapped my own screws to fit with the screws that this comes with. And it works bloody well. And in fact, I've got at least two left-handed versions. And I thought I, was, I felt, felt very adventurous when I first did it, because I thought, surely it can't work you know, what with this Chinese pot metal and all that sort of stuff. Now this one, you see, is is now playing me around a bit and I'm I'm trying to get a sense of where it wants to go. There we are. It's in and that's the last. I'm going to trouble it. So as long as you don't take them out again, you don't really have to worry and there's no reason to take them out. But it, as soon as it you get into that position I just got to where it's sticking and it's not going in freely, stop and gently try again as, as with any small screw or machine bolt that's oops that's the point at which you're going to strip something and the, if you strip the threads on these little 
plates, um, the base plate here. It's very easy to do, but you don't really have any means of. Potentially, you might be able to repair it with a hole next door to it, and it may just accommodate it within the spread of the um, saddles. But you don't want to be trying that out as a desperate measure. So, absolutely tiptoe round to begin with, as I'm doing here. Grease up what these particular bits in the saddle more than anything else. Um, don't worry about the back section with the drums or the worm involved gear as this strange people call it. Worm involved gear. Worm involved. Now this one, oh that's not moving because I've already locked it down, silly me. Right, now it's moving. Okay, that's the other thing too. It's good you've got this lock but if you try turning it without the lock released, you may find you strip the head off the unit. So lock it, and just if you use the lock on it, you don't absolutely have to. Once the string's leaning on it, it's not going to rise up of its own free will. The only chance, the only thing under pressure it's ever likely to do is go down, and it can't do it. But if you do use the lock, do remember to undo it every time you try and make an adjustment, if you make an adjustment. Otherwise, you could strip out the head of the hex doofer grub screw. Right, so here are all my doofers, I keep forgetting words, my saddles um, put back on and now I'm going to, I'm going to have to take, oh I'm so stupid I'm going to take them off because I need to, I need to draw. Right, anyway, well that was good, to, I'll take them off again, how about that, I was just wanted to show you um, how to do it. So let's take them all off again. Wow. Now this, I know I can take them off with this one because although the end of the hex key is a little bit soft, um, I know that everything's greased and it's loose. I don't have to put it under pressure. If I'd done them up tight, then I would be seeking to use that silver one first. So I'm just lifting them all out one by one and keeping them all in order for now. And so I can just put them on in the right order. I don't need to re-grease these, they will have grease in the thread there. And again, when you're taking them off, very careful to keep this, your hex key vertical. You want it to come straight out, no sideways moving. Right. Okay, so that can go over here for now. And the important bit now is we're going to go back to getting this directly where we want it. Now there is a problem we're going to come back to regarding the nut. It's going to need something to happen. But whatever I do with that, the position of this is still going to be the same. So I'm going to use a loose high E for a minute, and I'm just going to push it to what I know will be the front of its range, which is there. And I'm going to aim to bring that in line with its with the, m the markings I've got here. And this line is pretty darn straight, so I just want to um, I'll just check that everything's square. It'll work if it isn't absolutely square. Um, what I might just do is I might just mark where it sits forward there and make sure it's squared off. Oh. So I'll use my eyeballing skills to make sure this thing is evenly spaced. Here's the new front line of the tuna block. No, the whole block. No, what am I doing? Silly me. Um, front line. Front line. And that pushes back. I, sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. Forget the second line, it's the front line, the first line that matters. I'm pushing backwards. But I'm using, actually I'm using the second one as a guide. That's, that's why I drew it. Are you silly or what? Okay, so that's not in the right place. That's the right place. That's the edge up there. That's my mark. Are we directly above it there? Um, are we directly above it there? You off the mark, central mark there, on the mark there, on the mark there, spread it out. All right, that's my that's my position. It is a bit wobbly. 
Now I'm going to even this up, eyeball it. That looks um, okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw around it like so. Now the good thing, in a sense, if you get this bit wrong, this kind of top mounting bridge is forgiving. Because in the event that you get it completely wrong, you can, of course, go back in and adjust it and you know fill the one that's in the wrong place um, and have another go. So now what I've done is I've drawn in the four fixing screw positions and that should be dead on the mark. So before we commit to it, um, I'm going to now gently refit my high E straight down, light touch, as far forward as it will go. That's just there. So we put that on there, put that to there, line up the holes, and we've got that string positioned there. Now if we really felt in the mood to do it, we could get another string. Let's use what we've got. We've got a couple of, let's use their eights. Who wants an eight? Let's use this eight. Nobody's going to use an eight for a high E. Much as it's nice having one spare on there. Let's just, let's just put it to work for a minute. Um, so what I'm going to do is just, if I can get this thing to come out, I'm going to load up the string and just pull it taut and make sure it's where I remember it. Of course, a simple piece of green tape suddenly becomes a major catastrophe. Would you come on, please? Thank you. This green tape is, is not powerful, strong when you want it to be. But when you don't want it to be, it seems to hold on to things for dear life. Right. <coughs> so I'm going to hook this over the top and the other end. And I'm going to come down to here and I'm going to run it over. I don't know how well you can see this, but if you were to look down from here. It's not really central, but there you are. Anyway, you can see it. it actually, from there, it looks like there's a lot of space, which there actually is. Um, but we've just run it down the other side without moving the bridge. And what we get running off the other drum is we get the same thing. Um, in fact, I'm planning for a tiny bit more room on this side. Now, we'll come to the neck in a minute. So I'm, I'm happy with the positioning of this. So what I'm going to do with that right there, I'm going to draw myself. And again, I always do this by eyeballing. I'm going to eyeball myself a center point on each of these dots and I'm going to run a line through them just to be sure. Look at that, look at that. Talk, about, talk about eyeball skill. Ta -da! So I'm going to draw a line through them just to, well they are what they are, but just to be sure that they do all line up. We should find them. All spot on. Yes. Then I'm going to get my famous scribe and I'm going to make the mark. Before I make the mark, sense check. We've done it, we put that on, that's fitted, that's not going to move any further back because the zero fret is staying where it is. Come back to here, that is in its position. We've got it off the mark, we're hanging over the edge for the 648, that's because we're only going to go backwards. It's always more more backwards -er that we need than forwards. -er. If I get wrong on that, I'll have to fill and move, but I don't think I am wrong. So there's the first one. There's the second one. There's the third one. Oops, Daisy. There's the third one. And there's the fourth one. So I've got a mark as I am committed. Now comes the pilot drill affair. And I'm going to look in my packet of Chinese 
apart and we'll see what we've got. Sorry, the view is a bit cluttered at the moment. So we've got a Chinese headpiece, which I'll show you, but I've got a few of these. Funnily enough, this isn't actually a bad headpiece at all. The only challenge is that you have to cut the headstock on an angle, um, and that, for most people, is really difficult to do. I don't know what the angle is. It could be as little as 40... Oh, actually, you know what? I'm not even sure. Let me just check. The angle is... <laughs> what, in, what in the holy grail is it? Now it's really difficult to say because it's quite a thick thing without a line. The angle is about 60, 70 degrees, right? And that would be very difficult to do on the end of a curved neck. So it looks great, but unless you're a factory, you have really would struggle to use that. Sorry, here. Um, and then here we've got our supplied... We've got a bunch of hex keys. Very kindly supplied you with a few different sizes one for each of the hex keys on the unit but most of them we aren't going to touch and then we've got we've got headstock uh, headpiece screws oh, we've got, for some reason we've got impossible to access mounting screws and we've according to this we've got one supplied with one headstock a headpiece screw uh, which is bad <laughs> that's no good at all. oh no there's the other one thank you <laughs> Okay, so we've got, just a sense check, we've got quite a depth of material to screw in, but that's okay, we've got the room. We need a size gauge. Now, we ought to think what sort of wood. If it's hardwood, we need to go much closer to the size of the a pilot hole, that's closer to the size of the screw. So here we have four in total with the thread, so a two and a half should be a good grip. Uh, let's just have a sense check. Yeah, that should hold it. Um, now what I don't have, believe it or not, is a vertical, one of those vertical screw thingies. So I'm going to do this by hand and from where you're sitting it will probably look completely wrong. Ah, and that's the final thing. Let us put on uh, a guide, height guide. If we can but find our tape. So the depth is below the thing, Shing. is total depth. Come on, don't be so stiff, baby. So that's coming about 27 through there. So really, we probably want to go 20 just to be on the safe side. We want happy for some of it to cut into the raw wood. We don't want it all sort of cut down to the bottom. So I just want to get myself a straightish line, please. Um, and another one, probably. So after I've done this, we'll have a look at the headstock problem, headpiece problem and try and figure a way around it. And it, I have to say, it's absolutely not unique to this guitar, this, this exact guitar. Um, the last ones I set up had exactly the same problem. Um, and it was it completely surprised me, actually. Um, in fact, the Hona... Oh, for God's sake. See, look, it doesn't stick when you want it to. The Hona... Uh, I did the carving and the Hona... And the, the Hona, and I think, hmm, no, was it Hona? I think the Hona might have been right, but the carving wasn't. It had a real problem with it. I'm not sure if it's the other way around. But anyway, it's definitely got this problem here, so we'll see it in a second. Okay, here's my guide. Here's my drill. Now we're running at normal speed. It feels a bit <sighs> slow. Okay, let's go.
Well, as you can imagine, I was pleased to learn, or pleased when I discovered this. Um, this didn't need any drilling um, or any routing out because it's just nice that it's done and you can just carry on. Okay, so here we go. Let's turn it around, put it on. That looks lovely. <laughs> Let's get a good, 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 good screwdriver bit. Straight, normal, star-headed thing. Just, now, what I want to do is I want to be sure, first of all, that this is not too... Uh, I'm going to do something else first. Mm. Since we are going to be going in a bit wider, let, let me just see if I could. What did we say? Four and a half, didn't we? Two and a half, that's probably not enough. Let's just deepen this a bit. Not deepen it, widen it is the word I'm looking for. I don't want to split, split this block, whatever I do. There is a chart somewhere that will tell you, and a good carpenter will know straight away what the optimal size is. But I'm not your, <laughs> not your normal carpenter. So I sort of am guessing based on the material and the screw. So I'm just going to lower this a tiny bit, only because we don't need not to, but I also just want to make sure it doesn't split anything. Okay, right, now we can attach this. Once I've attached this, we can then put some strings on, and in doing so, um, also we can remember this, we need to just wipe the uh, marker pen off that. Feels pretty good. So I'm just gonna before I. Well it's a bit a bit late now anyway since I've made the holes, but I'm just going to double check my fitting. Yeah, that feels good, man. Um, Just got my hand right in the way. It's not the, probably not a good view at all. So this fixture is pretty chunky. I'm not going to go anywhere. Forget there has to be uh, there has to be a, a ground wire, and it's just in the right place to go through. In fact, it's a tiny fraction, a bit too far forward, back, or something. So I probably could have done it slightly different place, but it's, it's better than being. Well, it could be worse. Put it that way. Okay. So obviously this is needs a bit of tightening to get it to fixed down. It's, blimey, it's quite... It's got to go quite tight to stop its movement. Let's use it with my hand. Good, good. Good, good, good. Okay. So my plan will be, ooh, I suppose I better put the saddles on just now, because we're going to string it up, because along the way, six are on, right, we're going to string it up, because I'm going to also want to 
I'm going to want to load it up and do precision fret leveling. And then once we've done that part of it, we'll be ready to um, strip everything off again and be ready to wait for the finishing opportunity. And that means cleaning the finish because I've handled it a lot since. Okay, so we're good. We're as far forward as we can be. Oh, sorry, I guess far back on the plate. I, you'd hardly notice the ground wire going under there. It would be barely visible. Um, slight challenge is that you, if you go too far forward, you might find yourself constrained by the maximum forwardness of the D, which can be an absolute pain. So, you, so it's, I realised that it's not so much the overall constraint of movement on this thing, it's that it doesn't like to be too big a spread. Um, and actually I should have thought because really the D, the forwardness of the D is the primary constraint and I forgot that. So, you know, but the worst comes to the worst. We will, if it had to happen, we would fill it and replace it. But I don't think that would be necessary. Right, so technically now we are in the land of <coughs> having put the bridge on. It's nice and solid. Our tuners, uh, our, yeah, our tuners are lightly fitted. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some old strings, which I took off something, a setup, and I'm going to use these for our first set of strings. Um, and conveniently, we'll take the heads uh, off them. I like, yeah, I've sort of tried to flatten them out a bit, but we can cut them because we don't need the whole length, I think, being headless. So let us, let us bring you down this end, because I want to show you I think actually this string is much better. The strings I was looking at just now were going to be a problem, but this could be a way around it. So I'm going to just try and stay uh, focused on this for a minute. You won't see what I'm doing at the other end just yet, but so here would go <coughs> our string. And look at that. That's good. Now I'm going to point at it and show you. The previous string I just put on had windings that went up to there, which is terrible. So this is Judging by the colours on this, this is probably a rotor sound. Has it got a red? No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. It's got a red, but it hasn't got two pairs of red. Oh, God. Well, maybe we'll find out. This may be a, this may be a um, Daddario. But either which way, we do have to be careful because not all strings have the windings short enough. I think it was a mistake when Hona made this. They should have pushed this headstock back to ac accommodate all types of strings. The only alternative you could do would be to make a bar or something, thread a bar through there and have them all push back. But it's a bit of a faff. You, you absolutely do not want those sharp, knotty windings touching the zero fret. But thankfully, here we haven't got it. So let's and now not worry about that and let's come back to the other end where we can show the normal tuning process. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay that there for a second. So for tuning, in this case, I'm going to use lightly torqued 5mm sockety thing to go in there. And I'm going to, however I do it, whatever I do, I'm going to treat it lightly. So what I do is I come down here and I pull tap to the end of the guitar in this case. And it's about, I would say, it's about an inch and a quarter past the drum. And I'm going to cut it at that point. Okay, so that's my start point for this guitar. Now I want you to be able to see this, so I'm, I'm going to get in the way of the overhead camera if I can. And I'm going to try and give you the closest up view we can get. So you can see what, exactly what I'm doing. It's really important, I think. I would say that. So look. There, yeah, yeah, something like that. Right, okay, don't move anything. So we've got the ball end dropped out the other end, so I put it back in. And that's a slight problem. So as you do this, I'm going to, as I do this, I'm going to use a capo because with a ball end fixing, the, as soon as I slack this off, the ball is going to fall out the end and that isn't going to help me load this up. So I'm going to use a capo to hold the ball end in. Slight annoyance. So the first thing I do, if you can see me, can you see me? There we go. I'm sorry. Like that. 
So there's my cut end, and in here, I can now see, pointing up at me at about that angle, I can see the hole in the center of this. Now with the, um, with the, you really can't see so well, but I don't know if you can, maybe you can, I'll look in there, right. Um, can you see the string going through? Now with the wound strings, my recommendation is you pull it to there, and hold it and start to wind. That'd be plenty to anchor it, but don't try that with the, the plain strings. Doing this on the wound strings will get you to wind it on without a great big loose bit like this sticking through and causing a bump. It's not the end of the world if it does. It's better to have it stick or stay on than not stay on. But I know from experience I can pull it right through to the end like that or even to there. As long as I hold it before I start winding now, uh, whilst getting you the camera position, and you want to see the thing go in the thing like so. Right, make sure I've got it the right way. And we want it wind downwards. So it's forward count clockwise on the thing. Now it's going down and I hold this and I pull it so it bends upwards now. And then once that's done, you can see it coming around there like that, uh, vaguely. And I'm holding the thingy. I'm holding the screwdriver in the direction of the thing. <laughs> I know what I mean. And then I release the... Uh, -hoo! I release the... Um, num, 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 num. Capo. So, straight away, let's have a close look. We've got our first string, uh, low E, wound on the drum, like so, uh, over the saddle, um, which are the ball saddle part, which, by the way, is currently too low. So you can see it's down. Actually, it's just above, actually, so we can go up from there. That's great. Then we come down to this end, uh, and if I can line up, we're sitting on the zero fret, and we're above. It's got a bit of a kink because it's an old string, but it's above the first fret nicely. Great. So I'm not going to tighten it any further, but what I am going to do is I'm going to... Um, going to just zip, shoot back down there. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now think, I'm going to say to myself, what do I need to do here? Oh yes, I want to raise the thing. To raise it, we screw the little thing inwards. Now we can use either of these devices, but we want to make sure, first of all, that the brake, the lock is out. So we pull the lock as far out as possible. Now we're going to go inwards on the tuning, sorry, the height adjuster, and you may just see that it's starting to raise the thing up. And I get to about there. Now what will happen is if I go, actually it's, it's higher than that needs to be, if I go all the way through and I find that I can't get the middle D and G high enough, then I'll obviously have to come back, but this is too high. So on this kind of setup, it's much better to look at this from the side. So again, with my tuning one, um, the weight or tension of the string normally will pull it down. In this case, the tension is off, so I'm just going to push. Uh, I'll push on the cam, the uh, silvery bit, and it'll brass bit, and it'll go down. So really, also, you won't quite know what the uh, action is like until you've um, tightened it up a bit more. So at the moment, it's claiming to be one mil. OK, so let's do it up a little tighter. Um, now with this, I'm going to, I'm going to use my <laughs> I would use my tuning knob. Here it is. Why not? Because that's what it's there for. I'll cut that. So we're in a bit more tuning load, and this will give me a better look at the action. And the action is sitting at one. So that's going to be too low. But what I want to be sure is that we can get it up. Now, this is pretty good, and we should be able to still wind it up. It's not too much load. You don't have to have it completely slacked off to make those adjustments. And we'll call that one, 1 1.5. So that is the action set beautifully but uh, on my first string, using a combination of things. Now, let's do the other ones, since we're here. Oh, but before I do that, since I'm going to do precision fret leveling, I'm going to just move this a little bit to one side and I will just give myself a head start and 
mark up all these frets. Now, the reason I'm doing that now without even test playing it is because I know I've got to do this job. It's a new set of frets. They will need to be leveled. So I will get on to it without even playing it. Is there a, a fractional chance that they would play? Yes, but I would be amazingly surprised if they were completely perfect straight out of the fretting uh, stocks. They won't be. It's just not possible. Nobody can do it. Now, the problem I've got is I'm not going to be leveling, well, not problem, I'm not going to be leveling the zero fret. And the zero fret, even though it's only a, a uh, it's, it's approximately one grade difference, uh, maybe a fraction too high for my liking, which, which means it gives us a, a, a kind of um, a slightly, yeah, slightly too high, come on, this is a sensible word, slightly too high first fret action. Now, the thing is, I'd hate this cap, oh God, I hate it. The thing is, um, the thing is, the problem you've got is that when you're buying fret wire and you're trying to find one fret wire that will use, that will work with the, as a zero fret for the other fret wire you've got, um, you can only really, you can only really go down a gauge as available to you from the commercial you know, fret supplies, you can't really, you can't really do anything else. So you're kind of stuck with the standard steps that they give you within normal fret wire manufacture. Um, so it may be that uh, it's too, slightly too high. The only alternative we've got then is to manually reduce the fret and, um, and try to well, not try to, but, but um, manually reduce it by a certain amount, and then uh, and then what am I going to say? Uh, Recrown it. So I just want to get that right in the right spot, bend it, and we're good to go. So you can see the angle. I'm, well, you might be able to see the angle I'm holding the holding the screwdriver at it's not it's not 45 degrees but it's it's not as um, it's not completely vertical either okay Ow. So, so here we go I'm going to get all these on then I'm going to do all the individual heights and then I'm going to do the intonation or I'll test it or try and I won't actually don't need the intonation for now the intonation is of course the back and forwards of each one of these um, now, with with it when it comes to the the plain ones, I would recommend that you go a quarter of an inch past the back of the thing. This is for you, Lawrence, and cut it. And that quarter inch only because the, these plain ones have a tendency to try. If you don't put enough on, they will try and come off. Now, with the plain ones, I also recommend you go all the way through until the little bit of string hits the back. Don't try and pull it back and just start doing it when it's just poking out. Let it go all the way to the back. That will give you the extra bit of locking as well. And also, it won't get in the way. It's thin enough now not to get in the way of the rest of the string winding around. I wonder, I've got to wonder, have they changed, slightly changed the gearing in here? It seems like it's slower than before. I could be wrong. I could be very wrong. Okay, so there's... This one, put this one on, hold on to it, put the capo back on. These strings are a bit kinked now from the fact that the other end was used in a strap bridge, so there's got some kinks at the other end, but that's okay. We're, we're only using it to do the precision fret leveling part things. So get my get the hole come round, push it all the way through to the back wall, make sure it stays there. Oops, and go clockwise. and lock it as it comes right round. That's on, and we come to the last one. Well, this will be the first stringing up of this guitar. Um, 
since it's total tear down. <laughs> Lock that again. Uh, the capo is a very handy thing for this. Um, I would recommend it. You, if you had a locking uh, headpiece, then you obviously wouldn't need that. Um, you could just lock them down at that end. But I am glad it doesn't have, because a locking headpiece is a very crude way to lock strings in place. But you do need the capo for the restring. Keep the string taut or in place, even while you can't keep it taut. Fabulous. Well, look at that. Now we've got everything attached. The next job, we know that all our, well, let's say we don't know. We've, we're going to do height adjustments, so let's make sure all of our locking grub screws are out. And they're the closest to you, if you're right-handed and looking at it from this angle. Now, also, don't forget, we've got everything on can be moved around mode, all right? Um, so let's just, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to worry about them for now, actually. I'm going to just, just push them to where I want them, just for for the sake of looks, and it's a pure sort of lazy guesswork. And I'm not doing any ultra tightening. Now, um, this one, it is doable by hand actually, but it's not perfect, and it's not that easy. So I'm just gonna push this one back. Again, each one of these will eventually re reach its m maximum push back. Um, from which you won't go any further. So getting this right from the outset is so important. And getting it, working it round the string is also a little bit difficult. So those, I think those little cross things have actually increased the grippability of this as well. Good stuff, Chinese manufacturers. Now the action is absolutely great at this end. One of the concerns I've got about this headpiece, I don't know if you can see it, this is floating dead, straight above it, I can't quite see, but it's actually, the headpiece is biased, it's actually fixed a tiny bit too much towards this side, so we've got a bit more on the base side, it, it's okay, it, it ends up being enough for all strings while we go down here, but it's just an annoying little detail from the factory, right, so, so now I'm going to, we've got all our uh, height adjustments slacked off, and now I'm going to eyeball these for a minute and just to see if we can get fairly close to where I need to go and then I'll obviously bring out the um, he's a bit loose I'll bring out the um, I will get with the measuring device in a minute so, so I'm just just working by eye at the moment getting them to approximately the same heights as long as we can get this to the perfect set of action within our given range we've got it all we've got it all sorted okay so now i'm just going to go back over with the action of the measure now this has got to go quite a bit okay let's go that's one wow is that one no actually that's that's 1.5 now remember i said as you pull it back out if you haven't got a lot of force on the string, pulling it down. Oh, I'm using the wrong one, that's a lock, see? But if you haven't got a lot of force on the string, it may not pull down. Um, it did, but it may not, and you may need to push it just slightly. Right, that's 1.2. This isn't high enough. Tuning one. Not quite there yet. Tuning one. Come on, that's a bit too much. Down a tiny bit. That's looking good. Up on this one. I just want it to be right in my sweet spot of heights. That's pretty good. That's perhaps a bit too high. Also could do with tightening up that one. Give it a bit of a more realistic pull. low again so that's why tightening it up is quite good because um, oh, that's the lock silly man silly man uh, 1.5 down a bit and that's already on 
0.6, that's a bit too much, so down. Nice, nice, and this one now will be too high. So down with this one. Okay, let's get a bit more. Now I'm going to do a bit more tightening. Much better gears than before. This is a little well-kept secret. These things have improved. That's really good. I'm pleased about that. So a little bit higher. Very accurate now. Um, liking it. Liking it. Down a tiny bit. That's good. That's too high. Well, wrong one. Uh, come on, D. 1.5. It's the G that's too high. Yeah, this is working really smoothly, actually. I'm very impressed. That's good. That's good. I'm happy with that. So with that in mind, I'm now going to come to the closest ones to me, the lock, and I'm going to lock them all in, just because I can. Lock, lock, the nearest ones. And that actually, I noticed that pushed that one down a tiny bit. Well, it sort of moved the whole barrel as it kind of pressed it into lock, but hopefully that hasn't, I'll double check, but I don't think, no, that's, that's fine. Alrighty, and it may have adjusted the high E a tiny fraction. Yeah, no, that's okay. So now we've got a out of tune Hona playing for the first time since its complete breakdown. Now Uh, it's obviously I haven't stretched the strings or anything. Fine, happy with that. So we've made some progress on this Sunday evening. Uh, I don't know what the time is doing. Let me just have a quick look and a blow of my nose. But we are in doing well. The basics of that. Ooh, eight o'clock. Okay. The basics of that bridge. <coughs> I hope I've been able to explain to you in uh, some detail, um, and I'll sort of fly around now to kind of show you how it looks strung up and how easy that was to tune up. Um, looking at it in 3D, ready to play. Obviously, pickups not aboard, but I'm not going to do the play. I'm going to tonight level the frets um, now. What I haven't checked is the relief, and of course the relief gets adjusted through there. So let's have a, a zoom out while we're still in the mood. And <coughs> what am I looking for? Well, let's just check. I wanted to check one thing. <laughs> Hot damn. That's telling me it's a slight bit flat, <coughs> which means I need to move it, but I don't want to do that. That's not right. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, well, look at that. I'm going to have to move that. Oh, well, I told you as much. Nobody will ever know. Um, okay, so this needs a move, but I'll do that separately. What I'll do now, I'll ignore the intonation. I don't know. I checked that. I thought that was good, but it's not. Um, we've actually got very little re uh, relief in there. Um, I'm looking at the first fret action, and it's not too bad. Um, I'll, I'll do the levelling, and then I'll reconsider afterwards if what, if any, has to come off that. Um, I, pr I prefer not to, but when things have to, they have to. So the good thing about this is it's going to get levelled as just as if it was uh, a regular guitar, because that's what it is. Um, I can go all the way up to, but not the including, not including the zero fret. Um, so let's have a look. We've got 24 frets on here, so we're not going to get all the way up unless we put another one on there. And let's do that, and then that comes to there. So that's about our maximum spread. Okay. So what I'll do here is I'll do the leveling because it needs to be done and we'll see straight away where the high frets are and I totally expect to see some. Right? The hard thing about this is when you have a zero fret, I've lost me a little bit of wood, um, when you have a zero fret you basically um, don't get to move these frets quite as easily out of the way as I do with um, regular things which you can uh, frets where you can just push the things off the nut but a little piece of wood at the other end is going to help um, just spread the strings out of the way so now I'm going to which it could do with being a bit further a bit wider ah, have I got something a bit wider here's a bit of rosewood that's quite wide wow that's way off good that'll do okay so here we go a little bit of leveling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, straight away, what I'm going to be looking for is obvious high spots. Just make sure there's nothing major problem. And then, of course, as we uh, go up, we'll, we'll do play the notes and see if there are any problematic notes. It's obviously not good for the strings, bending them like this out of the way, but um, it's better than a poke in the eye. Now, I've got... Couple of, a couple of low spots here and here and there. So there's a couple of high spots, but we'll keep going and then we'll play test play. The main thing is we, as long as they play at the action that we've chosen, that's the main concern. Um, we don't really mind if there's a bit of unevenness, residual unevenness under there. A bit low down that end, but that could be the, a sort of kink in the shape of the the neck where it goes into the body. Wouldn't surprise me. Okay, so the first. Oh, ooh, where's the body gone? Fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, next. Um, Wait, no, I'm going to push this apart. Well, I'll do it this way. Push, stretch, and that's good. And that's good. So, yeah, um, I'll have to move the bridge a fraction. I thought I'd got that straight on the mark, but... Oh, that's how, how difficult it can be. The reason I know I have to move it is because I know that I've got no further uh, intonation room on the high E in the direction it would have to go because I've already set it at its full extent, like a plonker. That's all right, though. You live and learn the hard way. It's actually not bad at all. Recalibrate for the G track. Uh, 
where? Hang on a minute. I'm in the wrong place. You're there. Okay. Well, I think after this, I will I'll take, turn the camera off after this, and what I'll do is I'll sand and polish out the frets, the sort of usual routine, and then I will <coughs> stay. Come on, you can stay. You're not going to ping a undone. Uh, and then I will, if it goes ping, I'm going to get shot with a piece of rosewood. Uh, and then I will do the move, pretend it never happened. That's so odd. I measured that so carefully. Now what I want to know at this point, as I just get this G track done, it feels actually the G track feels everything feels good. What I'm going to be wanting to do on the G track is just make sure that any high E bends happily bend up there without any problems. So wow. Brilliant. Everything is going swimmingly. Apart from the bridge position. But don't tell anyone. It's just too embarrassing. Uh, let's just calibrate D. What track are we looking at? D, 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 D. And I do it this side of the D, which is kind of odd since I'm going to bend it the other way. But hey, hey, hey. Well, that ain't going to work, so, um, Sam. Get it with it. You're there, and there, and there. No, there. And it's the same anyway, so I might as well not have bothered. But it was good to check. I stay there. <coughs> okay. <laughs> I think the, I, th I think the possibly the problem with the positioning is, I think it stems from looking down on a, a saddle that has a certain amount of height and trying to extrapolate that down to the ground. Um, I can, I'm, I've marked the place right, but as soon as I'm looking down the saddle, it's it's easy to go wrong. I think that what is, is what happens. I've got to figure out a better way of doing that. You know, for a for a guitar with a almost completely flat neck at the moment, that is not a bad set of um, frets. Low fret up there, taken care of just about. So once I've done this leveling and recrowning and everything, then basically we're yeah. This is a slightly different shape up here. It does not quite. It sort of flattens out a bit. Um, yeah. Once we've done the recrowning and everything, then we're And we're sort of ready to clean it all up and get into the um, finish side of things. I'm happy with that, kiddos. That's going in there, that's going in there, that's going in there. Wow, like it, la 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 like it. Well, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it pains me massively to, um, to um, remove these strings. But hey, you get a look at removing the strings again, so 
When it comes time to remove the strings, I recommend you counterclockwise. Now obviously I use the electric drivery thing because it does help things, but you can take the you know take it down at this point and then you can say so long to do I want to say so long to yeah yeah I'm not gonna string it up for a long time yet. <laughs> well technically well I'm gonna push it forward and I did, mm, maybe maybe I would keep them mind you restringing with the same coiled strings is is a bit hopeful but I'm a bit short on spare strings at the moment so I think I'm gonna have to so here's the long-winded way you can flatten these out I will flatten them out only because I want to recheck the Intonation when I replace the bird. So it's all good and simple. Nothing untoward, complicated, or too worrying. Everything I like these new units they're reassuringly good and they seem to adjust very positively and I've got to say they're better than the, the ones I've had on previous ones so that's just a, a nice improvement over time okay so off come all the ball ends at the other end and we can just quick this bunch of things to one side where I will bore myself to tears um, flattening out the strings so I can feed them back onto those drums one more time but there we are we've got the leveling done the, one of the nice things about the leveling in a situation like this is it it really does confirm the state of the fret so that leveling has left me with some confidence now uh, here's a question do I or don't I take down this zero fret a tiny bit and how much do I take it down and how do I know how much I've taken it down eh what do you think well we, it's too high but this is good if I take it off so let's get I don't want to take this off too many times and put it on too many times but I will do it and be very sort of precise and careful with its removal um, because it's it's too important this has to fit and hold on beautifully and I'm going to need to put it back on again in a minute if I want to move the bridge after I've moved the bridge and retested but anyway so off it comes and I don't want to wear out the holes or anything like that so I'm just kind of spinning in a straight line using an age-old technique called I don't know use your body mate it's off to one side now that has a bit of an angle too funnily enough but it that's uh, straight, that's 90 degrees, of course it is. Duh. Right, so at this point, young sir could obviously attack, it's the best time now to attack this zero fret. Ha! Huh. The problem with the zero fret is no device on earth will measure it accurately. So I could say to you, it is, well I know what it should be actually, it should be 1.47 tall and it's saying 1.75? Nonsense. 1.28 that's nonsense 1.99 that's idiotic so obviously this completely depends on whether you're standing the reader reader <laughs> device up so I have to say there's practically no meaningful benefit of trying to measure this so it's quite a tricky thought if we were R2 were R2 take this down and we do want it a bit lower but we're now trying to lower it with a sort of point of view of guessing how much lower it has to be. <laughs> well, we can sort of see it with our bare eyes. I've got bare eyes. 
No, I had somewhere. Oh, mm, so, mm, man. Somewhere I had a bit of this stuck to a bit of that. Is this it? It is. And it's probably got a bit lost, a bit limp and puny. It doesn't have an awful lot of beef to it, this thing. But look at me. Look at me taking a flat top to this thing. Wow. What a, what a rebel. Do I know how much I'm flattening it? No. no. It's not much, actually. It's a blasted, heavy, <laughs> chewy thing, that. So the question is, do I take something meatier to that, or do I put on a bit of... Hello, any more? A bit of, a bit of something bitier. I don't really want to put on more than that. I think this is, this is 180, and I think that's probably more than enough. What one was that one? That's 180. We've got quite a lot of different gauge stuff. So let's put a bit of that on there and go. Uh, let's just do this. 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 Oh my god. He's just making it up. He hasn't done any clever measuring. Hardly, hardly, hardly taking anything off. And it, probably because I'm not probably. The problem is because I'm not going across it horizontally. It's it's not going down in a in a square square assed way. It's it's sort of cutting it. So the only way I think I could get it to cut uh, square would be to run over it like so. That'll give me a kind of this will give me a better look. This is stainless steel, don't forget. So um, I'm now manually attacking this right to the edge. Wow. I've got more, <laughs> so I don't mind. Um, it's not the end of the world if I have to use another one, but you know, just, just guess working across the USA. Stay up there, please. Um, I'm going to put you out of the way a minute. Put over there while I just try and get myself a better reach on this to get at this end here with this one. You, know, you can see me, so I'm just really just want to Hold it a bit still uh, and then it's not a very good edge for some reason. That's it. And then I have to just try and get me a, a straight edge as straight as I can. <sighs> I leaving my eyeballs be the judge of that and I think that is a a universally taken down doofy there you go how about that for being fairly even a bit more on the base side but do you know what I mean do you, do you know what I mean do you know what I mean do I want I mean I could I could go a bit further down just to even it all out but I think I'm getting I think you're making me get a little bit over the top here I think come on come on get real so we're saying the base is a little bit more than everything else. Okay, okay. Do a little bit more up here. A little bit more up here. A little bit more on here. A little bit more. A little bit more to meet the level of the base, man. <sighs> All right, I'm cool with that. Now, obviously, that is a scratchy devil. So I'm going to try and see if I can give it some. A little bit of uh, 320 grit love. No, 180 grit love, probably. It's just, I'm telling you, I've never done that to a fret before in my life. Do you get it? <laughs> but it's just a bridge. Um, no, a bridge. It's just a, a nut. Are you hearing me? And of course, what I'll do now is, having done that, what I'll do now is change the angle because you're getting the same shot from everywhere. It's boring. Oh yes, it's boring. Hello. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to prep it for re-crowning, just like any other fret. 
and then paint all these little fellas as well. And when this is recrowned, I think, well, we'll just get another chance to restring it when I've moved the bridge. Um, and then we'll know. And it'll either work and it will give us a low action. That's the problem with these zero fret things. Uh, since the zero fret sets the angle, moving the headstock headpiece around does nothing. There's no point moving that around or putting shims under there. What you're, you've got to do, like, oh, where that came from, um, what you've got to do is you've got to you have to adjust the zero fret itself. So you've just got to take it down. There's no, there's no nice way out of it, I'm afraid. So we've got jumbo frets, and they're all pretty jumbo, so we're going to start with the king of jumbo, the zero fret, the stainless steel king of jumbo. And that, to the untutored and the tutored eye, that is looking like a pretty straight up, um, pretty nicely rounded off fret. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope. I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll put it together before too long. And then this will be like a piece of cake compared to it, as I can tell. Very little levelling, really, all told on here. So, before we know what's happened, we're done. Now, I'm also thinking of doing a little bit more rounding off of the fret end here. Not with this one necessarily, although it can do it, but I, I, well, I might use the other file again. Just that uh, by the time I'd fully polished them or edged them back flush at home it had sharpened up the fret edges a little bit again which is what happens when you sandpaper it look at that that doesn't need any doing that hardly needs any so it's really very little leveling that's happened here a little bit more on that one but again very little Hey, when I go back tonight, I've got my Sailing Brothers video, Sunday video, and they're halfway to uh, Tonga in the Pacific Ocean, and they're running into some hefty storms. Now, thank thankfully, I know they've survived because I've heard from them or I've sent them comments and they've replied. So they are alive and they must have got to Tonga in one piece because everything video land is always backwards. I think I'm about the only person I get my stuff up on the day I do it. What an exciting life I have. Anyway. Um, yes, yeah, so that's tonight's thrills. <laughs> and, and, and I'm pleased that I've done this. I'm also very pleased at the result I got last night with Paul's acoustic. Um, I've decided after working a bit last night to come up with a, another shim, I've decided that what that fingerboard extension on that acoustic guitar really needs, because it's been badly, not badly, it's been distorted over time by having had a too big a shim thrust under it, and it's caused it to kind of curl up at the end. What I've decided is that it's better that it stays as a flying bit of extension. And that means that if it's going to reset itself, or if it's ever going to improve, it'll do it over time. It may not, in which case, down the line, we could look at putting a, um, putting a, putting what I'm going to say, we could look at putting a, uh, a shim underneath it, which is the same size and has a little bit of double-sided tape on it, which can possibly just hold the thing down but you know getting that's that that made that noise not the neck um bending something in the opposite way uh is 
almost as bad as bending it the wrong way to begin with. So I'm n very nervous about doing that. I, I would rather, it's, it, there's no real reason why it shouldn't just sit floating, because nothing's going to happen to it. And on that acoustic, really Paul already told me he's not going to be playing up there. So it won't come to any harm, and it's probably just better that it flies. It won't put any more unwanted pressure on anything. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop with the talkie talkies now. Oh, shit. Stop with the talkie talkies. Don't know what that was. Oh, that was my, hey man, my sticky magnet clock telling me the time and the, uh, what, what do we call that thing? Humidity. Come on, up you go. Stay there. Better view. Yeah, right. So I'm going to polish these all out. I'm going to do something with the bridge <coughs> and then I will be back actually well, I probably won't be back until it's time to do the reef uh, the, the, the clear finish um, I'm not in fact I'm not even going to do the shielding watch a great video on shielding today a chap called Dylan Dylan's home of tone or something like that and He's in a looks sounds like he's an electri electrical engineer, so knows what he's about, what he speaks, and um, he. I'm really gonna turn the camera off. He, uh, I'll just tell you this. <laughs> I put a link to it on the Real Love Guitars f f f Facebook page. Anyway, Dylan talked about um, some 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 myths about. Uh, shielding um, and interference and stuff and one of the, one of the things he pointed out which it, you know it was for me it was great to hear because it was like yes I knew this or I suspected this he said that um, uh, people mistakenly talk about a Faraday cage when and I've done it because um, I read it and they said oh it's a Faraday cage um, the idea of a Faraday cage actually has to be a complete sealed space in which your sensitive electronic equipment or your amplifiers, your receivers and your amplifiers that could blow up and amplify your hum or your 60 cycle or whatever or your unwanted radio frequency. Um, the idea of the cage is that it can shield it. But what he said was <laughs> that even if you made a Faraday cage, first of all, your pickup have to be inside it, which is not the case because obviously your pickup stick up through our what we think we're calling a Faraday cage and the pickup stick up pointing to the cosmos with their windings all sucking up RF frequency so that's no good so he points out that actually it is never with a guitar it is never a, a Faraday cage and so I am going to now stop using that phrase because it is not a Faraday cage thank you for that Dylan what he also said um, which was interesting. Um, he said that if you wanted to actually make a Faraday cage for a guitar, the reality is not only would the pickups have to be on the inside and covered up, so, but they'd also have to be behind a centimeter of copper, not not a thin bit of copper foil. And he he had worked out the maths to, to prove it. So, you know, that that's completely infeasible. It is like a lead-lined coffin, of course. Uh, <laughs> highly um, thingy, uh, sensitive military things do go inside rooms lined with centimetre more thick um, stuff, but uh, it's not going to be a guitar, and it certainly ain't going to be over the top of your pickups, sealing them in. So forget the Faraday cage. However, the, sh the idea of shielding does help somewhat, and it, it helps by um, attenuating, he said, the um, RF that hits the foiled areas, the, the, you know, the metalled areas you have around your pickups and in your cavities. He did say that, in his opinion, putting stuff in the, uh, the control cavity of, a, for example, a Telecaster made almost no difference at all. And he said, more to the point, any tight-fitting cavity that you put uh, copper foil into uh, can, if, unless you know exactly what you're doing, uh, can very easily end up with short circuits, and I've had plenty of those in the past. Um, anyway, so that that's 
he said, you know, don't even bother doing that. It's probably not even worth that. But he said, you know, it is worth to just, yes, do shield it in the sort of standard ways. Make sure all the shielding is absolutely grounded. It goes to earth. Um, and uh, don't, whatever you do, put shielding in either your tight Telecaster control uh, route because it will ground out on a switch lug or something, and I've had it a few times, uh, or in the jack socket. And I echo or you know, I second that because the jack socket, incredibly, is because it's out of view, you'll end up shorting something, and it, because it's out of view, it'll end up being the last place you look. And I've taken apart more than one perfectly good wiring up that I've done to find out why it doesn't work, assuming I've made a screw up in the wiring loom, and only to find when I've completely pulled all my remaining hair out that in fact, um, uh, wait a minute, let me check the, and you know, and you go into the tunnel which you can't see into, and you either have shielded it thinking that's what you're supposed to do, and the hot lug of the uh, jack has touched out against the grounded shielding equals a short, or, um, if it doesn't do that, it could be even be, and this is, as you can probably, no surprise to you, but um, I've t torn apart wiring looms a couple of times to finally end up in the control uh, into in the tunnel, realizing that actually I'd got the hot going to the ground and the what's it, the signal from the switch, let's say positive signal from switch, I've got it on the ground lug and vice versa. And of course it sits hidden away in there until you finally exhaust all opportunity, all, all options, and you suddenly try it as a last ditch and you find out that you've wasted all your time because that was what you got wrong in the first place. So that's doubly likely if you use shielding, so don't. So there's a, there's a minimum amount of efficacy of doing it. Um, not not a problem and, and probably worth doing within reason, it helps. It has to be grounded and it has to be um, oh, kept away from hot lugs, baby. Um, so that's uh, that, that was the gist of it. And it's sort of, I've learned most of that the hard way, but I didn't know about, for example, the, the fact that, it, well, it can't be a, a Faraday cage. Um, I, I didn't know that technically that had to be complete, but it does, and this isn't. Guitars aren't, so there we go. So, definitely watch, worth watching. Dylan, Dylan's uh, Home of Tone or something, probably, possibly. Um, I've put a link on the Real Love Guitars Facebook page for those who are interested. And it was on the Harley Benton uh, Modders page as well. Okay, so I've talked my way through the paperwork end of things here. Um, in order to reposition <coughs> the bridge, which, which we're not going to talk about, I will need to take all the little saddly bits off again, um, just, just for now, and then put them safely out of harm's way until I've recalculated the exact position and put it all back together. So. I'll do that in my own time. Oh, thanks for watching. See you soon. Okay, okay. So Lawrence, stringing up the guitar with this new bridge. So let me just show you where we're at. We've got two strings on already, but I'll take you through the process end to end. So hopefully we can see what's going on. So I start off by grabbing the next string in case, in this case, the D. So the idea is we're going to get this one just loosely held onto there. These are Daddario, and they thankfully just about seat okay on the zero fret. Now, let me show you what we do down the other end. Of course, some of these guitars, yours doesn't have it, but some guitars have um, a little rubber band at the top, which will keep the strings in place while you do the setting up but anyway um, this doesn't so you just have to kind of hold it and if it comes off it's not the end of the world so I'm just 
crudely moving the thing around. Okay, so you can see that I've gone uh, past, that's a horrible view, I've gone past the end of the bridge. Let's see what I can see. Right, past the end of the bridge. So I cut the string, lay it down here, cut it where it meets the back of the bridge, really. So I'm snipping there. And then obviously the string can easily fall out the other end. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just hold it, if I can, flat on the deck. Now, what I want to be able to do now is to get a zoom in. Let's see if I can get the best view I can get. Now, I want to get this in the little hole and I want to use my automatic thing and I'm going to pull it until it's just about disappearing on the other side. I don't want too much sticking out on these wound strings. And you might be able to see there that there's a little tiny bit of string sticking out. And as I come round, it's going to really sort of help lock it. And then I hold it up to keep the ball on the other end. And then gently with my power thing, with a five millimeter thing, bit, I'm just going to bring it down to in. So I'm going to do the next one now with the G. So this is the wound, uh, a plain one. So the first plain one, I come down here and I'm going to go a little bit longer. So about an inch past the back of the bridge and about a centimetre past the back of the wood. So similar sort of thing, just a little bit extra. And again, I want to hold this down so it doesn't come out. And this time for the plain strings, we're going to get our hole in position. And we're going to go all the way through and out the back. And I don't know if you can see there, but there's going to be a bit of string sticking up there. It's fine. It's better to have that now than not, because the wine, the wine will go on to there no problem at all with that bit sticking up. But if you short cut it on there, you run the risk of um, run the risk of it uh, undoing. It could be just slightly not enough. So on the plain strings, we want it to go all the way through to the back and that extra little bit uh, all the way through to the back of the drum with a little bit sticking up. So again, to the centimetre past the wood now for these plain ones. Oops, again, I'm just holding it down with, if I can, with one hand and keeping the hand on this bit. Maybe not be enough. Spin it round till you can see that hole go through. Make sure it's all the way through to the back and hitting the back, and then if it comes round, you can pull it up and it will lock itself. And then you're just basically now guiding it down under tension here. Not very good view. I'll do the last one at a wider view so you can sort of see what's going on. And I'm just letting this nicely come down to not too tight. Um, but I'll come back to that in a minute when we're stretching. So there's a sort of wide view, last string. High E. Okay, all the way to the end, a centimetre or so past there. Cut. And then we'll just hold it down with the palm if we can. Just to stop the ball end coming off. If you start winding it on, the ball end comes off. Then you can uh, just stop with the winding, reposition the ball end. There you go. So it's him holding up this loose string. And I'm just I'm not pushing too hard on this uh, drum that I'm winding. I'm just letting it do its thing. And it's taking up all the slack in different places. And there we have a note. Okay, so the first set of strings now on after the whole setup process. This should be straight through to playing nicely. Now, what I've done in the background is I've done, I've fitted the, um, uh, if you can see it in there, I've fitted the dock, the magnetic dock, um, but I'm going to leave that 24 hours before we put the magnetic key in there, but here is the magnetic key for winding. So, so let's get a, get a, a thing that makes a noise. Bing! Where did I put it now? I've gone and it's moved. Oh, no, it's hidden there. Tuning fork.
So there we are, first tuning up done on our new bridge setup. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Look at that. Everything nicely done. And we've still got our leg thing there. Right, so we're all good and done. Um, and like I say, I won't put this into place in its dock until tomorrow. It'll probably stay in there now. Um, in fact, I could probably safely lock it in there and it would just, it would still set around it, but there you go. That won't, that won't pull it out. It'll just sit there now and dry around it. There's your tuning knob in its dock. Isn't that neat and tidy? Barely visible, out of the way. And if you're playing and sitting with it on your knee, of course you can take it out. I'm not gonna do it now because it's gonna be setting in place, but that's absolutely fine. How about that? Okay, so that was the quick video of the stringing up. You can see, uh, stick with the Dario's because by the looks of it, the pack that I used, these nines here, um, not sixes, nines. Um, this pack here, you can tell that the winding stops just before, or certainly on these, just before the um, zero fret. So that's good. And then there we are, nice low action, perfectly set off there. Just gonna need to do some stretching now, and this will be ready to travel. How about that? I know it's been a long time in the making. Look at that. What a beauty. I'm very happy with that. I hope people like it too. Nice, um, nice uh, soft satin sheen. Very nice indeed. Okay, zoom out. Look at that. Finished. Ba -ba -ba. Everything's looking good. Action's beautiful down at the first fret. Lovely and low down here. We've obviously got a little bit of tweaking to do. Just check the electronics, everything's working. I haven't played it yet, but I'll play it at home to test and then that'll be fine. So there you go. That's the how you put on your new strings on this Chinese bridge um, and basically tighten them up. We went through, I think I went through in detail on the other part of the video, the, um, the um, sequence of putting together this bridge uh, obviously, you won't have to do anything with it just for now. Um, oops, so there you go. It will be, I'll have it set up ready to go. It's just ready to play and nothing else will need doing. And you should be rewarded with wonderful tuning stability and just go through that same process, you know, gently, carefully, um, you know, use the tuner knob. If you don't feel confident using that, just use the tuner knob to tighten them up. They'll, you'll get them done up just as easily, um, only fractionally slower. And then if you really get stuck and lose everything, you've also got your little ma magnetic clamp, clamp thing in there, uh, the little thingy, crank. And there you have your owner gold logo as well. So look at that, the natural, the Hona Naturel. I, I, I could have gone black with that, although I didn't have spare black ones. I did have some spare gold ones. I just thought there are some gold hints here. So I thought I'll, I'll live with that. Um, yeah. Now, there, there is on the finish up here, I think there's a bit of a hint of um, finish on the frets. They've been leveled and polished out before, so I'm not going to do any, any more to them because they have to do the whole set again, but they will just you know, play off. If there's any finish on there, the, the strings will just wear it off because it's already leveled underneath that. It's just a little bit of over, over spray um, from doing the finish. Anyway, there we have it. Woo. Oh, and one more thing included when I send it back, are two more zero frets, which I'll keep with your guitar. And then if you ever want to replace the zero fret, if it notches, then you can send it back to me with these and I will do it again. Uh, if I keep them here, I will without a doubt losing, so not a good idea. All right, there we have it, everything ready to go. Brilliant, enjoyed this job, Lawrence. Thank you for, um, thank you for letting me do it.